<clears throat> Good morning, everybody. We're going to wait just a minute here until the rest of everybody makes it in from the waiting room. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are going to start like we do each week with some Zoom housekeeping tips. Your Zoom toolbar is at the bottom of your screen. And I'm actually gonna pop a message into the chat. So that start might start flashing when the message goes into the chat there. And my message just welcomes you all here and reminds you to put your questions into the chat as we're talking today. And we'll try to get to as many of the questions in the chat as we have time for. But also if you have additional questions that come up between now and next week, feel free to email those to us at info at condolaw.net. If you get them to us by 4 p.m. on Tuesday, we will include them in the next day's Q&A session. If you get them to us after that, it just depends on whether we have time to prep for the question on shorter notice than usual. Also in the chat is our YouTube channel link. After these Q&As each week, within 24 hours at most, a video of each Q&A is posted to our YouTube channel. And if you expand the summary beneath the YouTube video, it includes a list of the topics that we answered questions on. So if you miss a Zoom or you're just curious about whether we've covered a certain topic, you can check out the YouTube channel and browse the subjects of the previous Zooms there. We also wanna remind everybody, oh, sorry, I guess I didn't continue or finish the Zoom housekeeping part. I think most of you already know this, but for those who may be newer, the chat icon, start and stop video icon, and the mute and unmute icons are on your Zoom toolbar. We ask that everybody remain muted for the duration of the Zoom, just to cut down on background noise and distraction. But if you need to unmute yourself to ask a question verbally, you can do that if you need to do that. We wanna remind everybody that we are here to give general information that we hope is broadly helpful and applicable to community associations in Washington state. We are not here to give legal advice. So if you find yourself submitting a question that is paragraphs long or asks us to interpret sections of your governing documents, or even just in general asks us, what should we do in this particular situation? We're probably not gonna be able to answer the question or at least not with the level of detail that you, you're hoping for. We can't give legal advice in this forum for a myriad of reasons, but the most practical one, other than it's also a violation of our ethics rules, which I guess is a really practical reason. Beyond that, it's difficult for us to give you advice when we don't know the totality of the circumstances that you're dealing with and all the specific provisions of your governing documents. So if somebody sends you one of our links and says CLG said XYZ, so you have to start doing this or stop doing that, you can just ignore them. And when you're in doubt about the topics that we cover here today or any other week, or about whether an action that you're taking on behalf of one of your communities is uh, the right thing to do, just consult with the association attorney so you can actually get specific legal advice for your situation. We also want to remind everybody that the nonprofit corporate filings portion of the Secretary of State website is down still. It's been down since the end of last year and will likely not be back up again until either the very end of February or the 1st of March. So if any of your associations need to renew their corporate status, you'll have to print the forms, download and print the forms from the Secretary of State website and mail them the forms with a check to do your renewal the old fashioned way. We also wanna remind everybody as we have been doing each week for the last number of weeks that because of how quickly things seem to be changing with COVID, sort of like just when we figure out what the situation is, the situation changes. Your communities should be reviewing and considering their COVID protocols if they have any or whether they should have some on a regular basis because of how quickly things have been changing. And we think a reasonable way to make sure that happens is to add it as a standing agenda item on your regular board meeting agenda. And part of why we are recommending that is because of course we actually think it's practical and the right thing to do and will help your association respond to the changing circumstances. It's also possible that being able to document that you regularly revisited this situation could 
protect the association from liability if there is ever later a question about whether the association did what it was supposed to have done to mitigate the risk of COVID within your communities. And finally, we do want to remind everybody that the eviction moratorium in Seattle has been extended through, I believe it's next Monday, Monday after next actually, February 14th. So stay tuned, we'll see if that gets extended again, but at this point, that is the expiration date of that moratorium in the city of Seattle. <clears throat> Excuse me. All right, Ken, did you wanna add anything before we jump into the questions? No, I'm good. All right, here's our first question. We would like to ask about anti-harassment policies. Do you have samples and what, if any, recommendations do you have? Are rules and regulations a good place to put them? And are these set by the board if the approval process is not spoken to in other governing documents? We do think that having a communications anti-harassment and anti-discrimination policy is a great idea. A lot of our clients are adopting them. They are adopted in the same manner as rules. So for non-Wakiowa communities, the board can adopt the policy without owner input if you want to do that, or you can ask for owner input, but it's not required. Well, Kiowa communities must send the proposed rule change or policy to the owners and allow a reasonable amount of time for owners to comment before the board can vote to adopt the policy. And the citation for the statute that requires that for Wakiowa communities is RCW 6490-505. Historically, associations tried to stay out of conflicts that were neighbor to neighbor, you know, just simply between owners, and there was no legal obligation to step in. But recent legal developments over the past few years have created a risk of liability. If there is illegal harassment or discrimination happening within your community, and the board fails to take action after being informed of it, and adopting an anti-harassment policy can demonstrate that an association takes these matters seriously. We do prepare policies like this, but we don't have a model that we can share at this time. We will certainly update folks if we, if we decide to prep a model like that. Ken, did you wanna add anything to that before I move to the next question? Well, I just was searching online to see if CAI had an anti-harassment policy they have one for their organization, and that actually might be something that someone could use as a model to adopt one for their individual community. So you can search CAI online, uh, anti-harassment policy, and at least see what uh, the national organization has to say on that. Thanks, Ken. All right, here's our next question. Ken has discussed the unambig unambiguous intent of Wakiowa's open meeting statute many times, but the language does not define what a violation of privacy entails for the purpose of conducting an executive session. Of course, the business judgment rule comes into play, so there is surely some board discretion about what constitutes a violation of privacy, but it would be enlightening to hear if there is any case law or legal parameters from which to draw reasonable conclusions that can help define this further. One scenario is that there is a director candidate appointment item in new business. Does the process of interviewing candidates rise to the level of violating privacy? Or since the same process happens during an annual meeting of the owners, does the customary procedure for open or closed proceedings provide legal merit to make a determination? Well, Wakaya was only enacted in 2018. So unfortunately, so far there is no case law that interprets the section of the statute talking about executive sessions. And there isn't case law, at least in Washington state, uh, interpreting previous statutes about executive session because there were no previous statutes that gave us the level of detail and definition that Wakaya does. We think that a reasonable starting point to make decisions about what topics to cover in executive session versus open session would be based on a number of factors, including the topics, of course, that are specifically listed for executive session in Wakaiowa, but also if there are other legally protected uh, sets of information, such as, for example, there are, there are statutes that protect contact information for victims of domestic violence. If you're discussing something that could touch on other legally protected information, 
we think that would be reasonable to consider in determining whether something would occur in executive session versus closed session. Another thing I think the association could consider is a subject where disclosure in open session could be detrimental to the association, its employees and or its owners. And I want to be clear here that I'm not talking about detrimental like bad publicity, right? If it's something that's just going to make the association look bad, but isn't actually going to harm the association financially or put anybody's safety or property at risk, that's not what I'm talking about. But an example of this is one of the categories that's included in the Wakaiowa list. So if you're in the middle of a confidential bidding process, for example, that's clearly listed in Wakaiowa as one of the topics appropriate to discuss in executive session. If there is a sort of similar set of information that could be harmful if it is disclosed in open session, you could consider that in including something in the executive session. It's hard to opine directly or specifically on the example that was given, we don't have enough information to determine whether asking questions in open session would violate an owner's privacy, specifically when you're talking about interviewing a, an owner who is a candidate to be appointed to serve out the remainder of an open board sentence, or not sentence, sorry, term. <laughs> um, so beyond these guidelines, we would recommend relying on the advice of your attorney. It is hard for me to imagine, like if you're if you're interviewing somebody that you're going to appoint to be on the board and owners would normally have the opportunity to ask questions of somebody before that person is elected to the board, I'm not really sure why that type of thing should occur in executive session. Although if you become aware of information about that owner that shouldn't be disclosed in the open session, then maybe you pivot and make that judgment call in real time as you become aware of the information. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think you've covered it. Okay, here's our next <clears throat> question. If a community meeting is recorded by the management company, do homeowners have the right to a copy of the recording? So probably I would say the purpose of the recording may make a difference as to the answer to this question. In general, creating a record, a recording of an association meeting or of a board meeting creates a record of the association and owners have the right to review association records. So owners have the right to request copies of most association records, which would also include a recording if that recording is a record of the association. This is part of why we generally recommend against recording association meetings and board meetings for a lot of different reasons, including this one. If the management company recorded the meeting for the sole purpose of preparing minutes, for one example, the recording might not actually be an association record. It could be an administrative tool for the management company. And the per so that kind of speaks to our comment that the purpose of the recording could matter when determining whether it's subject to owner review. Another example is that if you record a board meeting, for example, including executive session, that if that's recorded, that is not a record that the membership is entitled to review because the whole purpose of executive session is that it's not open like the rest of the board meeting. Questions like this certainly support our recommendation to our clients that associations develop and adopt and then comply with records retention policies. So you can have a, you can have a specific approach outlined for things like this. So I guess that's kind of the lawyer answer to this question, which is that it depends on a lot of different factors, whether the recording in question is subject to review by the homeowners. Did you want to add anything to that, Ken? Well, I'll add a comment. We had a client <clears throat> where an owner was insisting on seeing the board secretary's handwritten notes that had been kept during a meeting. And that's an example where I, <clears throat> I believe the secretary's personal notes are not records of the association. The secretary used those as an individual to create the minutes which would become a record of the association. And so it's certainly possible that a recording of a uh, meeting could have the same kind of a personal nature rather than being a record of the association. And that's why I think uh, your comment that it, it's important to know the purpose of the recording is uh, valuable in answering the question when looking at the specifics. Um, <clears throat> I also worry about the use of 
long recordings because it's certainly very common for people to not actually review an entire recording. So if you've got a two hour long meeting, it's common for people to get on and watch 10 or 15 minutes and then draw conclusions from those that limited period of time on what was done during the entire course of the meeting. And so the, the transparency, which perhaps posting recordings would assist uh, is certainly something I could acknowledge, but I don't think that that transparency actually comes to pass just because you've posted one and two hour long meetings on a website. Agreed, thank you, Ken. All right, our next question is this. Apologies if this has been covered in a previous call. How does an association go about enforcing a section of the CCNRs that have not been previously enforced? Most declarations have a section that's entitled no waiver or something similar to that. And the section stands for the idea that an association's failure to enforce in the past does not preclude them from enforcing in the future. So that being said, the type of issue that you're dealing with could result in a different answer. So start by consulting with the association's attorney. And if the ownership is likely to be shocked about, for example, a new board's intent to enforce in a different way than has been done in the past, one thing the board can consider is sending out a letter or holding a virtual meeting to communicate to the ownership that there is going to be a change with respect to enforcement, answer owner questions about what that might look like, et cetera. Keep in mind that an association can only assess fines to an owner's account if the association has a fine schedule that was adopted by the board and published to all of the owners and after a due process notification is given. So one of the two most common reasons we often have to tell our clients that a fine is not enforceable is because the most common reason is because they don't give a proper due process notification. And a second reason that comes up quite a lot is that they fine out of sync with their fine schedule. So the fine schedule has to be specific. You can't just fine like at the discretion of the board based on whatever type of violation occurs. The schedule has to basically put notice, put the owners on notice as how they could be fined if they violate the rules. Also keep in mind that some declarations have really specific convoluted requirements for enforcement or even just fining an owner. So pay attention to the governing documents in your approach to enforcement. Ken, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, I, I think it may be necessary for you to look at or get the assistance of an attorney to look at whether or not the provision you are going to start enforcing but have not been enforcing has actually been lost as a, um, a restriction on use of the property. There are cases in, and in Washington state where the courts have found that specific provisions in a set of CCNRs have been abandoned. So one example I think is a business use of property where a community wanted to try and prohibit a specific new business that was being operated by a homeowner, but the association had multiple businesses on other properties which had been in place for years, if not decades, and the association had not enforced against those businesses. And so the courts ruled that the prohibition against business use had been waived by the association over an extended period of time. So <clears throat> you need to be cautious about how you try and enforce something. You need to look at whether or not you are being discriminatory in your enforcement, only trying to enforce against one or two. We've certainly seen cases where something like a shed in the backyard, the board was trying to enforce and the defense provided by the homeowner was that there were 15 or 20 other sheds that were also out of compliance and the board was not enforcing against them. So it is important if you're going to try and start enforcing that you are enforcing <clears throat> uniformly in the community in order to avoid the appearance of discrimination. Thanks, Ken. <clears throat> All right, here's our next question. 
Can you talk about liens and what the requirements are prior to filing a lien? I'll start by saying that many associations, but not all of them, have an automatic lien. And I'm using air quotes because it's like this magical thing that the law says just springs into being the moment an owner's account becomes delinquent. So the associations that have this automatic lien include old and new act condos and Wakiowa communities. HOAs don't have this protection by statute. However, some HOA CCNRs specifically provide for an automatic lien, but it's kind of meaningless without a resale certificate requirement because in a community where let's say you are an HOA that the CCNRs provide for an automatic lien, but there's no resale certificate and an owner sells their lot, the lack of a recorded lien makes it next to impossible for the title company or escrow company to, to know that there is a balance due that's owing there. So in order to determine when you can record a lien, you'll wanna double check your governing documents, specifically the sections of the declaration that speak to assessments and collection of delinquent assessments, as well as the collection policy if the association has one. And if it doesn't, it should, whole different topic. Be sure to follow any limitations or procedures that are outlined in the governing documents. So for example, sometimes we'll see language that will say, when an account is past due by X number of days upon 10 days written notice or after giving the owner 10 days written notice, the association can record a lien against the lot. So you wanna make sure that if there are sort of procedures or timelines that are specified as required in the documents that you follow those. Apart from those sort of caveats, most associations can record a lien anytime there is a past due balance keeping in mind, of course, that the association's action has to be reasonable. So if the balance due is, if somebody misses one payment and the balance due is $200 and you're looking at recording a lien, you know, 20 days later, there's a question in my mind as to whether that action is reasonable. For a condo association with a statutory slash automatic lien, like we just, just, just discussed, and a resale certificate requirement, so protection that exists before the property could be sold in a voluntary transaction, it's probably reasonable to wait until there's a somewhat larger balance due before recording a lien. And I should be more precise in my language because what I consider to be a larger balance due might be very different than what other people consider to be a larger balance due. I would say if you're a condo association with monthly assessments and somebody is three months behind, that's a reasonable time frame to start considering whether to record a lien. And of course, you can talk through all of these decisions with your association attorney, because it matters how much the assessments are, what the owner's history is as far as payment or delinquency and other things. On the other hand, for an HOA with lower and less frequent assessments and no statutory automatic lien and no resale certificate requirement, it might be reasonable to record a lien much earlier or at a lower balance due than a condo association might. So these are, again, considerations you talk through with your boards and with your manager and with your association attorney. I want to make a note because this continues to come up even though the proclamation expired last year. The proclamation that was in effect from April of 2020 through July of 2021 Number one, it's expired. Number two, it did not prohibit or affect an association's ability to record a lien, send a demand letter, even foreclose on a lien. The only thing the pro proclamation did was prohibit late fees and interest during the time the proclamation was active. Everything else was on the table. And again, that proclamation has expired. A couple of other asides, we generally recommend that associations have their attorney record liens rather than the board or manager doing it themselves. I would estimate that well over 50% of the liens that we see recorded by a non-attorney have errors on them. And often the errors are significant enough that we just need to record a new lien or amend the one that has been recorded. So... <clears throat> Even though it's not required, and we certainly don't refuse to work with clients that record their own liens, we do think that that is best practice. From a liability perspective, it's also preferable, we think, because when your manager records a lien for you, you have to, the 
manager. And so you have no recourse if there is a problem with the for the association towards the lien, then you might have recourse against the law firm. It shifts the liability or the risk of the mistake essentially from the association to the law firm. So hopefully that covers it. If you have additional questions that you want me to clarify on or expound on, you can put a comment in the chat. And Ken, did you want to add anything to that? No, I'm good. Okay. Here's our next question. <clears throat> Excuse me. I know you have touched on this in the past, but can you speak to smoking in an owner's condominium unit when the smoke then radiates to neighboring units? In general, what would the association be responsible for in correcting this, if anything? Can any action be taken against the owner from smoking in their own unit when this is happening? For most condo associations, smoking is considered a use of the owner's unit and can only be prohibited by amending the declaration. And I'll, I'll comment as an aside that for new act condos, the percentage of ownership that has to vote in favor of a use restriction like this would be 90% plus any unit particularly affected. For old act condos, unless your declaration specifies a higher percentage, you would need to get two thirds of the voting power to support an amendment to change the use or restrict the use of a unit. So that being said, owners are also prohibited from doing anything in their unit that is considered offensive or noxious to their neighbors. As with most enforcement issues, especially those that begin between individual owners, we suggest a cooperative approach, at least in the beginning, and only escalating to more restrictive or punitive measures as those less punitive measures fail if they do. So as a starting point, one neighbor could ask the smoking neighbor to smoke less in their unit or to install air filters or exhaust fans to exhaust the smoke out of the building and out of the unit and mitigate how much of it seeps from one unit to the next. If the non-smoking neighbor uses a fan, it sucks air and therefore smoke into their unit, which would make the problem worse. So as a practical matter, that's something just to keep in mind. Associations can regulate and also even ban smoking in the common and limited common areas. Association could also consider designating a smoking area to kind of contain the problem to one area. The association could also decline to treat an owner smoking in their unit as an enforcement issue. So just because your documents create the ability to enforce does not mean the board has an obligation to enforce. And individual unit owners have the right to enforce the governing documents against other owners in court. So the board declining to enforce in a situation like this doesn't mean that the non-smoking owner neighbor has no options. They can litigate this and try to enforce the provisions of the governing documents against their neighbor in court. At one step the courts do look at when they decide whether a smoker can be restricted in their use of their unit is whether the association has taken less restrictive steps to try and mitigate or solve the problem. So try to make physical modifications to stop smoke from infiltrating from one unit to the next. Seal cracks in the walls, uh, install filtration systems in the um, you know, the uh, heat pumps, if, or depending on the way that your building is heated, have the smoking owner install and use exhaust fans, things like that. And, and the reason we comment or add that information is that a Colorado case actually upheld a ban on smoking in a condominium building, specifically, that case specifically found that less restrictive steps had failed in addressing the situation and the problem that was created by smoking within the unit. And that was part of why the court upheld the ban on smoking within that building. Ken, did you want to add anything to that one? Yeah, two things. I kind of follow on that last part is that it is possible that there are, quote, construction defects that are allowing the smoke or air to infiltrate from one unit to another. So it is certainly reasonable for a board to try and investigate whether or not- Like, I get it. You want your shit there fixed, are, but- there, there are physical problems that could be addressed in order to help solve the smoke infiltration. And then the other thing is that Washington state has 
fairly specifically ruled in appellate court uh, decision that cigarette smoke in residential properties is not a nuisance under Washington law. And I know that a lot of people disagree with that, um, but what it means is that you would have to be able to demonstrate that it's somehow a nuisance under the provisions of your specific declaration or CCNRs because you can't rely on common law to establish that it is a nuisance. Thanks, Ken. All right, so you might have noticed that I just put something into the chat. That was because the next question is, I am trying to find the most current information on condos and fitness room restrictions with COVID. Do you have a link to recommend? Beyond offering that most restrictions have been lifted with the exception of things like masking and vaccination requirements for, you know, like going to a gym like LA Fitness, most of the restrictions have been lifted. So things like building occupancy is based on fire code, right? You're not having to limit occupancy to 50% anymore. But the PDF that I just dropped into the chat is current recommendations and requirements from Washington State's Department of Health and should answer the question for any who have, uh, you know, need more details. Our next question is this, RCW 6490-455 allows voting by written ballot and up to 11 months to collect those ballots. Does this apply to old act condos also? If not, what are the written ballot rules for them? So RCW 6490-455 does not apply to old act condos. That's a part of Wakiowa. But the old act and the new act and the HOA act actually, these were all amended in 2021 with language that mirrors the language of Wakiowa. So for an old act condo, the section that you're looking for is RCW 6432-280, and it provides for voting by written ballots with or without a meeting and allows the board to extend the deadline for voting, and I'm going to quote from the statute here, for a reasonable period not to exceed 11 months. However, voting may only be extended if quorum is not met or the threshold minimum approval for the specific action at question isn't met. In other words, if you achieve quorum and you get the right number of votes to accept or reject a certain action, but you just don't like the results of the vote, you can't extend the time to vote in the hopes of changing the outcome. The reason you're allowed to extend the time to vote is so that you can either get quorum or get the percentage of votes that you need in order to do the thing you're trying to do. Ken, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah, we have uh, <clears throat> a lot of application of extending the deadline when we're dealing with amendments to declarations because it's difficult to just get the participation required if you need 67 or 75 percent of the membership to approve something. Uh, so <clears throat> the the statute very specifically allows for the board to extend the deadline in order to allow enough votes to be cast. So typically when we're dealing with amendments, we basically tell people that the voting is going to be extended until either enough votes are cast to approve or enough votes are cast to uh, defeat a amendment uh, or other action like that. Uh, we don't think you could do things like extend the voting deadline on something like your budget ratification, because that is not a, a uh, not an action suitable to vote by mail. But uh, it is reasonable to extend for amendments to the declarations or bylaws. Might be reasonable if you're trying to do something like a capital improvement that requires a specific percentage to approve a, uh, an expenditure. Thank you, Ken. All right, here's our next question. A board member of a 15 unit old act condo apparently installed hardwood floors without requesting board approval during a renovation. They also relocated kitchen water drain lines below the subfloor, which includes lightweight concrete floor soundproofing. Our CCNRs are, and published rules forbid hardwood floors, the rules stating that even if the resulting acoustics are the equivalent of carpet and pad, the board need not approve the request. No such request has been granted in the past. 
The owner has not provided the association with keys to their unit as required. Another board member who lives below that renovated unit is certain of the infraction based on changes in the unit acoustics, but is paralyzed by inaction. A third unit owner performing work on the roof believes they observed the wood floor through the unit's window, since, which has since been covered with curtains. How can this offense be documented for an attorney so that a notice of violation can be issued? So my starting point, as many might suspect, is that this is way too specific for our Zoom. It would require us to give you legal advice, which we can't do here. Generally, we can comment that there may be a section of the declaration that gives the association the right to enter the unit to inspect and or repair common elements or even to inspect the condition of the unit. But of course, that is hard to enforce if an owner is refusing to allow access to their unit, which may or may not be the case here. And we do not recommend that associations rely on that right to enter language in your declaration to enter a unit when an owner has said no, especially if the owner is, especially if the unit is occupied. So in other words, if you, if you need access to a unit for a legitimate purpose and the owner is refusing to allow that access and the unit is occupied, unless you're dealing with an actual emergency like a fire or a massive leak or something, we recommend you get a court order before entering a unit owner's, a unit's without permission. More generally, with respect to a violation like this, the board does have a duty to investigate and gather objective information before determining whether a violation has occurred. And there are certainly ways to document a, a violation like this without seeing it. You don't necessarily have to have a photograph of the hardwood floor in order to make a reasonable determination that the owner has in fact installed a hardwood floor. I think part of what you need to do is determine as a board whether this is a violation that you have an interest in stopping. And these are all very general suggestions. So for advice specific to your circumstances, you should consult with your association attorney because hearkening back to some of our earlier comments in response to a different question, you'll wanna look at how enforcement has been handled in general within your community in the past, with this specific issue, of course, whether you have a fine schedule that allows you to levy fines. So I think you have to start by talking with an association attorney who can look at your specific situation and your documents so they can tell you how to move forward if you actually wanna enforce this issue. Ken, did you have anything that you wanna to add to that? Just a reminder also that if the board cannot make a determination, it does not stop the neighbor who is offended from pursuing all of the legal remedies that they have because they can independently enforce the provisions of the declaration. They don't need the board to do that for them. Thanks, Ken. That's a great point. All right, here's our next question. The board members of an HOA agreed to just roll over the 2021 budget. I said that was fine, but I think we still need to ratify it. What is the correct process for this rollover? We also have a condo board that refuses to meet and approve a budget. By default, all we have to work with is an old budget rolling over. What, if any, notification do we have to provide to the rest of the homeowners? It seems like we have an obligation to notify them of what is happening, but no authority to spend the association's money on a mailing. What is the correct process in this case? I think ideally an association should ratify its budget each year, even if it doesn't change. And whether you adopt a new budget or not, you should be sending out notice of the amount of the assessments at minimum anyways, right? Coupon booklets or whatever your normal notification at the beginning of a new budget year is. RCW 6490-525, which is the section of Wakiowa about budget ratification says that, and the quote is, Within 30 days after adoption of any proposed budget for a common interest community, the board must provide a copy of the budget to all the unit owners and set a date for a meeting of the unit owners to consider ratification of the budget, not less than 14 nor more than 50 days after providing the budget. So if the board actually votes to adopt a proposed budget, even if it's the same as last year's budget, they should ratify it to comply with the statute. That being said, because the remedy for failure to properly ratify a budget is basically falling back on the previous year's budget, 
it's probably a relatively low risk decision to skip the ratification process if neither the budget nor the assessments are changing. And beyond that, I think we can't comment further without crossing the lines from general information to legal advice. Ken, did you wanna add anything to that one? I'm good. Okay, those were all of the questions that were submitted in advance, but we have some questions from the chat. I'm gonna lob this one at you, Ken, because it's um, definitely your wheelhouse. Can you please remind us what RCW requires condos to hire an architect when doing renovation projects? Is that one you know off the top of your head? Well, it's not all renovation projects, but RCW 6455 is the statute which requires any building envelope work which exceeds 5% of the tax assessed value of the building to be designed and stamped by a licensed architect or engineer. And it requires an independent third party, meaning not the owner and not the contractor to inspect the work to confirm that the work uh, has substantially complied with the requirements of the waterproofing design. So 6455 is specific to um, the building exterior, roofing, decks, siding, windows, doors on the outside. And it was uh, adopted by the legislature in 2005 in order to try and improve the quality of construction on multifamily properties. So it's not just condos, but all multifamily apartment houses also are required to comply with the same law. And it is specific to the building envelope. And it, it's, uh, if you're just remodeling the interior of a, uh, a lobby or something like that, there's not any statutory requirement that I'm aware of for uh, an architect, engineer, or any construction oversight. Thank you, Ken. All right, the next question that came in is this. If a board member gets upset and threatens to quit, but then they calm down after a couple of weeks and they never submitted a resignation letter, are they still a part of the board? I think I'm gonna start by saying it probably depends on exactly the circumstances. Were they in a board meeting? What exactly did they say? But if they were just ticked off about something and they just were you know, like, I'm fed up with this, I'm gonna quit. And that's all that was said. And they never actually resign. I'm, my, my inclination is to say that they are still a part of the board. I could envision a scenario in which what they said in the context in which they said it might change that answer. What do you think, Ken? I, I think that, uh, again, generally, and it's gonna be really specific to the case, but generally, if the board member has not taken some, I would say official act, meaning a record to inform the association of their resigning or leaving the board, that it's not going to be effective. And we have, I'll say, board members all the time who threaten to quit or will send, you know, an email. But if it's done at a board meeting, uh, so it can be an action which is recorded in board meeting minutes, I would say that is probably effective as a resignation. Um, if a, a letter is sent to the association, uh, which is stating formally that they quit. I think I would recognize that as being final. Uh, probably an email is not going to qualify because most associations have not taken the necessary step of designating an email as an official means of receiving notice for the association. Just as in, you know, an owner has to agree to receive notice in an electronic format, the association also needs to agree to receive notice in an electronic format. And I'm aware of very few associations that have actually gone through that step of notifying owners that they will accept notice electronically and then uh, providing owners with an electronic address. Thanks, Ken. All right, the last question that we have in the chat, so now would be the time to pop a question in there if you have something you want us to talk about. If a property manager takes a leave of absence, should the management company assign a temporary property manager? I think there are probably so many variables here that we can't give you a, a, a black and white answer that will apply in all circumstances. I think 
One thing you would need to do is look at what your management contract says about what happens in, in this scenario like this. It also probably depends on the length of the leave of absence, as well as the level of management services that are provided to the association, right? There's a really broad spectrum of how involved the management company is with the association from full service management that requires a lot of daily interaction to bookkeeping only and then everything in between there. So I think you probably need to look to your management contract, determine how long the leave of absence is, talk with the management company or the manager, the manager's manager or the owner of the management company about what their plan is for that leave of absence, and then and then go from there. What do you think, Ken? Well, I might look at it as, uh, you know, what is the obligation that my law firm has to provide a person to respond to my, my client's needs? So if I have an attorney who takes a leave of absence or a vacation, um, <clears throat> I want that client still to be able to call my office and get advice if they need it. But I certainly could look at some of the questions that they are asking as uh, not being so urgent that it's efficient to try and retrain another attorney on that particular matter or that particular client. So it, it really depends on what what we're talking about. And I don't think there's going to be one answer. Um, I, you know, if I have an attorney who's off for an extended period of time, I am going to have all their emails diverted to another attorney, uh, or I am going to tell the client who the attorney is they should speak to. And I would expect most management companies would provide their customers with a way of dealing with association business in the absence of the manager. Most uh, management companies I'm aware of have a 24 hour phone number for emergencies and somebody responds. I would expect that at a minimum, that kind of service would be provided in the absence of the manager. Thank you, Ken. All right, I am not seeing any other questions in the chat. So I think we are going to end early today. Thank you again for joining us. We will see you back here next week. Bye everybody.